Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Stone Chapel Podcast. Hope you're doing well, and as we are changing platforms, we hope our subscribers have found us. If not, we hope they will in the near future. We want to welcome any and all new listeners. My name is David Capes. The Stone Chapel Podcast is part now of the Church Leaders Podcast Network, which is dedicated to resourcing church leaders in order to help them face the complexities of ministry. The Church Leaders Podcast Network supports pastors and ministry leaders by challenging assumptions, providing insights, and offering practical steps that will help church leaders navigate a variety of cultures and contexts. You can learn more about that at churchleaders.com slash podcast network. This is our first podcast in the network, and we're excited to be part of it. We are sponsored by the Lanier Theological Library and Learning Center in Houston, Texas. If you haven't visited us, you need to see it. It's like a little piece of Oxford that is broken off and fallen in northwest Houston. The Stone Chapel Podcast is dedicated to bringing you the best scholars and and leaders, the best dialogue around scripture and theology. Let's hear more from the podcast founder, Ed Stetzer, about some research that is going to help church leaders. Ed? You know, it's a changing world, and one of the things that help us understand the changing world is research. And so as churches have been struggling and families may be disconnected and sometimes drifting away from the church, we're kind of dealing with some of the questions of where do we go from here? And the Communio Nationwide Survey on Faith and Relationships really kind of points to the family decline and how it relates to faith decline in the United States. Actually, the survey has three key issues that are impacting our society today. Go to communio.org slash study to download the nationwide study on faith and relationships. Thanks, Ed. Our first podcast as part of the series is with N.T. Wright, who needs little, maybe no introduction. We're talking with him about a book he co-authored with Michael Bird, our friend from Australia, entitled Jesus and the Powers. We're living through a long period of decaying democracies and terrifying tyrants. How is all this going to come out? What is behind these these powers, these parties, these these factions. What should Christians do? What should the church do? What should we know in, in view of all these developments? To ask the Francis Schaeffer question once again, how then shall we live? It's a powerful book. It's one that I think a lot of church leaders and people all around should be reading. So today, scholar, churchman, writer, and speaker, N.T. Wright on the Stone Chapel Podcast. Hello, I'm Tom Wright, and I'm Senior Research Fellow at Wycliffe Hall in Oxford. You may conceivably know me as N.T. Wright, My parents played this trick on me of calling me by my second name, but uh, ordinarily I go by Tom Wright. Dr. N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, good to see you. Welcome back to the Stone Chapel Podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, you do a lot of these podcasts, I know, but when you do it for us, it's just so important for us to hear from you. Your last one with us was on the Romans Road a couple of years back, and that was one of our top podcast that year. We're going to be talking about your book, Jesus and the Powers, the one that you co-authored with Michael Bird, who is our friend from Australia. Yep, indeed. How is it working with Michael? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to ask you that, but but co-writing a book is not easy to do. It isn't. Michael made it very easy, as with the previous thing we collaborated on, which was the big fat book called The New Testament in Its World where what Michael did was to comb through my longer works and pulling out key strands and and special bits. And with this, he just went through looking for anything I'd written on political theology, I think, Ah. over the years, and then brought it into a coherent frame. And then we agreed some new bits that I would write and some new bits that he would write, and then we would send them to each other and then make comments and edit it together. On top, um, yeah. I tease, Mike, that my main task is to go through and take out the Australian jokes. But, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but actually, I mean, it, he is so good. And actually, the last three chapters, I think, in this book, which were his originally, which I, I was delighted with because he's read a lot of stuff in terms of contemporary political thought and Christian political mm-hmm. thought, which mm-hmm. I hadn't read except for one or two bits. 
So it's it's been a, a great journey, actually. And the long chapter that I wrote in this book, which is on the powers in Colossians and John, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I found that, I mean, especially fascinating. And if you if somebody reads it, they'll see. I wrote it just after the coronation of King Charles. And the coronation of mm-hmm. King Charles, as m- millions of people around the world watched, began with our Hindu prime minister in Westminster Abbey with the words in letters of gold behind him saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God, reading Colossians 1, 15 following. And I sat there thinking there are so many ironies going on on my television screen right, right now. now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I mean, th- th- that for me is very helpful because I think people have had an oversimplistic view that either you believe that um, the church should just get out of politics entirely or mm. you believe that we should be in there trying to make the kingdom of God happen. And for many people, it's an either or. And actually right. life is much more complicated, multi-layered, and interesting than that. But we all want simple handles, don't we? We, we do. We simple do. handles. And, I mean, you know, you can have some of those. Jesus is Lord, therefore Caesar isn't. Mm. But hang on, in a democracy, Caesar is all of us. So now what mm. do we do? And mm. so once one complexifies it, you realize, yeah, okay, you can have the simple slogans, but then you say, now in the real world, dot, 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 and then it comes out a bit differently. Well, the subtitle of the book is Christian Political Witness in an Age of Totalitarian Terror and Dysfunctional Democracies. It's published by Zondervan Reflective Publishers. When I saw the book, I thought immediately about Paul to the Powers Mm -hmm. as a beginning place. And I thought about spiritual powers. We don't wrestle against Mm -hmm. flesh and blood, but we wrestle against spiritual powers and principalities, et cetera, et cetera. And that's true. We don't want to deny that. And yet we are in this world Mm -hmm. and we want the kingdom of God to fill this world, to be Mm -hmm. done on earth as it is in Mm -hmm. heaven. It does get very complicated, doesn't it? (laughs) And how do you put it all together? Yeah, it goes on being difficult because the language of the powers, both in the first century and now, is inevitably fuzzy, and I think it's bound to be so, because I think when Paul is going through and talking about powers and authorities and thrones and dominions, I don't think he has a specific dictionary definition of each of those which he would carefully differentiate from the next door one. I mean, you'll notice whenever he does one of these lists, whether it's in Colossians 1 or the end of Romans 8 or wherever, Mm. it comes out slightly differently, and Mm -hmm. there are different powers and authorities. And I think Paul is aware that when you're facing stuff that he faced in the world, whether it's um, looking at a new temple going up to Caesar in Ephesus or Corinth or somewhere, or whether it's just being aware of what we would call the social forces or cultural forces, that there are shadowy things happening which are more than the sum total of the human intentions involved at the time. And, you know, this is a point that my late lamented friend Walter Wink used to make, that the, the guy who thinks he runs General Motors, actually General Motors is running him. Him. And if <laughs> if he gets out of the way, yeah. it'll it'll carry on, right. um, and so on and so forth. That people in the first century were perhaps more aware than we are post Enlightenment of the existence of shadowy forces compelling us to do things. We talk about economic forces or political mm-hmm. forces. And for us, it's almost a dead metaphor. But actually, when you run up against stuff, then it stops being a dead metaphor and you discover there's something which logically you ought to be able to do, but which you can't do and you can't quite see why not. And you talk to people about it and, yeah, we should be able to make that happen, but then something is in the way. What is that something? Well, that's the question. Our problem has been that we've forced this either or, that it's either human authorities or what we might call spiritual or non-human authorities. And in the New Testament world, I think those two overlap and interlock so that Caesar on his throne and all his many minions around in Mm. the Roman world, they are ordinary human beings. You can talk to them, you can engage them, you can push back at them if you're so minded. But uh, at the same time, they are wielding a power which is more than their own power. Now, sometimes they will do that quite knowingly, like there is a politician in another country right now who is claiming that 
um, he has the power of God within him for mm. the election which he's fighting right now as we're doing this recording. Mm. And in the ancient Roman world, most of the um, people like consuls in Rome, um, they were also priests in one of the local cults. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so they would be trying to channel what they would see as their religious possibilities. And now St. Paul would say, actually, those great gods, Zeus and the rest, they don't exist. But there are these nasty little things called daimonia, uh, demons, as we mm -hmm. might say. Mm -hmm. uh, again, our trouble is that the word demons... We don't have the quite language well, they do. Well, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that, I mean, a daimonium uh, or a, a daimon, there's a slippery meaning there because, you know, Socrates thought he had a, a daimon, which was like a sort of super conscience. Mm -hmm. It was a good thing, telling him what to do and what not yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. But then it slides all the way into... Um, nasty, corrupt little creatures who will get under your skin and force you to do things you didn't want to do. So that there, that sense that we are in a world of power, of, of different sorts of powers that we can't quite name accurately, pin down and deal with, but that we, in believing that Jesus is Lord, part of that is believing that on the cross he has won the victory over all powers mm. and that therefore, even if we can't, understand them and name them all we can say nevertheless when we're in these situations mm -hmm. where bad things are happening or whatever we can be assured that jesus is lord and then we can go to work to say when the emperor comes to us and says can you help me run this country which you know has happened in history mm -hmm. um, this is tricky but yes we believe that god does want wise humans mm -hmm. to be in charge of his world and we will hold you to account for that wisdom. So that's the way in, as, as far as I can see. As I think about American politics in particular, I often turn to Mike Bird. Mike Bird seems to be reading up more. When I want to know what's going on in my country, I talk to Mike <laughs> talk Bird. Talk to Australian. Yes, yeah, yes. I do. No, he, he seems funny. to have his finger on the pulse. Ah, so. ah. Isn't part of the problem? That we have driven a wedge between secular and sacred. Yeah, uh, of course. and uh, But that's written into your constitution. I right. Think. Um, but, uh, but I think that's part it, of the problem. But, uh, it is part of the problem because actually it doesn't work. It never did work. Um, but particularly in the last 50 years, it doesn't work, which is why now there are people up and down your country who are quite happily writing about and trying to get into mm. the question of the overlap and how you do the life of prayer and worship and so on, as well as the life mm. of public thought. But a, a lot of it goes back to the Enlightenment's Epicureanism. You know, Thomas Jefferson said, I am an Epicurean, in which the gods are removed from the world and don't have anything mm. to do with us, and we don't have anything to do with them. Now, if you're a deist, which is a, a softer version of the same thing, mm. you can go and visit God on a Sunday afternoon if you want, like visiting an elderly relative in a care home, um, but you don't expect to be told what to do in public policy the next day. Mm. However, if you believe in the kingdom of God, if you believe that, that there is one God who's made one world and through Jesus God is reclaiming his sovereignty over that world, then you've got a whole different set of questions. And the Enlightenment put those questions on hold, which allowed all sorts of countries, not least my own, Britain, to say, OK, we will now go and colonize the world and make a lot of money out of that, actually, because the religious bit is on the side. Some, oh, we, we, we may give you the Bible while we're at it. I've seen in African countries that slogan, when the missionaries arrived here, they had the Bible and we had the land. How come they've now got the land and we've got the yeah, Bible? You know? yeah, and yeah. I understand that. Not um, quite any, even exchange from their point of view. Well, right. exactly, exactly. But yeah, the Enlightenment settlement, whether it's in America or France, or actually in Britain, because though we have an established church, many, many people still think in terms of religion and politics can't mix. That has to be challenged in the name of a whole biblical theology rooted in the Old Testament coming through the announcements of Jesus about the kingdom of God. And, and we see that working out in the book of Acts. I mean, it isn't a case of the apostles going out into the world and simply saying, we're in charge now, because they're not. But they are holding the world to account, not least by establishing communities which show that there is a different way to be human mm -hmm. and which make people sit up and say, I didn't know you could do it like that. And sometimes the authorities are delighted at that and sometimes they're horrified. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so ever since the book of Acts, we've been negotiating that. But we've got to negotiate it and not assume that our 18th century settlement will do the job for us. 
One of the things we see today is that people will either withdraw from life, political life, like I don't know who to vote for, whom I can't vote, so I'm not going to vote because I don't want to vote for this person or I don't want to vote for that person, right? I don't want to support that. I don't want to support that. We've got that on the one hand. And then the other, well, we've got to get in there. We've got to work hard. We've got to change. We've got to overthrow, in a Mm -hmm. sense. The kingdom of God, it seems to me, is not in either position. Yeah, I would agree with that. And uh, I I understand that dilemma. That feeling that people have. But I still think that in America, there are lots of people who think that by getting this right, we will have almost a messiah figure who will come and deliver mm. us and do everything that we want somebody's going to do. Mm. In, in Britain, we don't think like that, in, except that Tony Blair presented as a sort of messiah figure because we all got so fed up with Margaret Thatcher and then John Major. Mm. Here's a new fresh-faced chap who right. can new talk guy, the talk. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when Barack Obama was um, became president, one of our English commentators said he's he's basically Tony Blair with brains. <laughs> so, Poor but, guy. <laughs> but, quite, but Blair um, did have that sort of messianic feel, which then he came a huge cropper on, of course, with the Iraq war. It was mm. never it's never been forgiven for that. But normally in Britain, we are not choosing the very best of the very best. We're choosing the least worst. Who, sort of know that going in. Exactly. Okay. That, that we probably don't like half of what this guy's doing. We probably don't like two-thirds of what that guy's doing. So let's go for the one that we like half of, at least. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and so the, there's a kind of very low expectation. In a sense, because, you know, as a Christian, I don't think my hope is in this world, mm. right? Or in those Democrats, well, that, Republicans, that's, Independents, that's true. Now, Green I mean, Party. Of course, it varies enormously. And I think we say this in the book that looking from an Australian or a British or an American perspective, in a sense, we're in the lucky position of being able to be part of churches that can preach sermons about all this and that can teach one another. I remember when I was at the Lambeth Conference in 2008, um, walking along a path behind a group of bishops from Myanmar who were talking in rather hushed tones about whether there were any Christians on the junta who were running the country. Mm. I remember thinking... This is a very different situation for living the kingdom of God when you're just anxious about this all the way through. And, of course, across the world, there's been all sorts of different things so that our perspective as Westerners, as British or American or wherever, is a very specialized thing in a sense, and it's a a luxurious position. But I think I would still say, even if one was in Myanmar or anywhere else where there was severe repression, or a country like Saudi Arabia, where you um, you wouldn't even be allowed to celebrate the Eucharist in a hotel room and and that sort of thing, um, nevertheless, there is an announcement of the kingdom of God which must go out, even if only by a few Christians meeting together and maybe praying silently or whatever, which somehow resonates out into the world of the powers and Mm. does stuff which we don't fully understand. Let's come back and talk a little bit about the two options, totalitarian terror, it seems Mm -hmm. to be on one Mm -hmm. side, and the other is a democracy that's not working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've seen that. I remember the shudder that went through the world at the American election in, was it um, 2000, when um, the voting right at the end was right. was stalled um, with the hanging chads the in hanging Florida. The hanging chads, yes, yes. And the rest of the world kind of looked on and thought, America, the land of the free, you're supposed to know how democracy works. Uh-huh. Um, and the whole thing was hinging on that. And it was settled ultimately in the courts. It was settled ultimately in the courts, and not right. everybody liked that because it went with the politics of that court. Mm. We in Britain have had huge dysfunction in our democracy over the last generation. I mean, we've had people like Boris Johnson and Liz Truss as prime ministers, and we look back and shudder, and how did that happen? Mm. And I think we have not educated a new political class. We have not brought on wise, trained leaders to be um, people of civic responsibility and dignity and good sense. And so we've allowed people with all sorts of motives and different abilities to come in. I'm not Mm. saying that all our politicians are are corrupt because they're not. I'm not saying they're all Mm. incompetent because they're not. Mm. But we just haven't got a range of people like we used to have who could run for office and you'd think, well, that's a safe pair of hands. I may disagree with what he or she says at certain points, but Mm. at least there's a maturity. There's a seasoned wisdom there. They know their way around. Mm. We, We just don't seem to have that. And then where we really are in trouble... And we're partly in trouble, of course, because 
horrible things are happening in the world. Ukraine, also, Israel, uh, Rafa. I mean, we all sort yeah. of half bought the lie that we'd had the end of history with the end of the Cold War and that everything was going to be nice liberal democracies from now on. Mm -hmm. And Hillary Clinton with the Arab Spring saying it's important to be on the right side of history. Well, excuse me, how do we know which way history is going? We don't. Mm -hmm. And the idea that... The whole world is drifting in the direction of, of liberal democracy, and we just have to help them a bit. And that is incredibly naive. Mm. So then to re-articulate what a Christian vision might be, that, that's really, really important. That's what we're trying to do. How has the book done so far, um, the feedback that you've Yeah, had good feedback and some very nice blurbs from, from some quite well, important Nicholas people. Well, Nicholas Walters, Walters that's, that's Miroslav, not a bad. And Miroslav Volf Miroslav, and others, yeah, yes. Absolutely. Thank, thanks, guys. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, no, good. That's, that's great it's, because it's, these, it's, these guys know political oh, absolutely, theology. Absolutely. Right? It's been out slightly longer in Britain than here in America. I'm not sure why. And we've had some good feedback in the UK as well. In fact, I was going to be doing a lecture based on this in Parliament um, three weeks ago, and then that was when I got sick. So I'm not quite sure how, how things are going. Yeah, I, I think people have been grateful to put some cards on the table and to show that it is possible and even desirable for Christians to have this conversation. Um, we shouldn't I, uh, be shut out of the conversation. Well, quite, quite. On, and, and we shouldn't step back as if we don't have anything to add it, to Exactly. The and there are lots of devout Christians who do go into politics. And whether mm. they're particularly competent politicians or not, they want to do the right thing. And they want to say their prayers and make wise decisions. But I don't sense that our traditions on either side of the Atlantic have given them too much help over recent years, except mm. help of the wrong sort of pressure groups pushing hard in a particular direction where they feel, oh dear, I better go along with these guys, otherwise I won't get elected. You know, so the standing back and discerning wise ways forward, that's so important. But we need to have structures in place to facilitate that. Otherwise, you can be swept away by the, the new tyrannies or whatever. And the old statement, power corrupts. Oh, Absolute right. power corrupts, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I think that's part of the challenge because I think a number of people who are genuine, deep-thinking, abiding Christians end up there. Yeah. But it's hard to stay where you want to stay yeah. because yeah. of what power does to you. Well, that's that's absolutely right. But, I mean— the problem then is that many Christians have retreated from the idea of power altogether. And I've been in some circles where the very word power is a dirty word. Oh, we don't believe in power. Mm. You know, we believe in, in weakness. Well, yes, that's what Paul says in Second Corinthians. Right. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. However, ever since Genesis 1 and Psalm 8, God wants wise human beings to look after his world, to mm. share in the work of stewarding creation mm, governing the world yeah. exactly because when i've written about the kingdom of god i remember one person coming back and saying so now if there's a problem i just have to say oh there isn't a problem anymore because god's in charge the answer is the way god is in charge is by working through wise obedient humble human beings um, and this means that the either or of either god does it or we do it is simply wrong. But we are not used to thinking in terms of, it's basically Trinitarian terms, in terms of God the Father working by the Spirit through obedient, wise humans to further the purpose and mission and pattern of the Son. And that's how it ought to work. Who is the suffering servant? Uh, right? Exactly, I mean, exactly. So right. all that's going on. So yeah. he's the servant of all. He's the, he's the one who will yeah. ultimately suffer and, as well. Well, there's two passages I go back to when people ask me about political theology. One is John 18 and 19, where Jesus is arguing with Pontius Pilate about kingdom, truth, and power. Mm. Oh, my goodness, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Caesar, yeah. kind of slugging it out intellectually. It's amazing. The other is Mark 10, where James and John want to sit at Jesus' right and left. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, listen, the rulers of this world boss and bully people. They get their own way by force. Said, We're not going to do it like that. We're going to do it the other way up. Yeah. If, you, if anyone wants to be great, they must be your servant. Because... <laughs> The Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. And so many political theologians have taken the first bit and forgotten the atonement theology. Mm. So many devout Christians have taken the atonement theology out of Mark 10, 45, and have forgotten that that comes at the heart of a statement of political theology. Yeah, And then we just haven't seen the question, so what does it look like then when servant leadership is really 
um, being acted out in a community. Mm. That's, I, I suspect there's lots of places in the church which haven't even started to ask that question, and maybe it's time we did. Well, you and Michael Bird have given us some good <laughs> political theology to think about in a time when I think we have a lot of confusion. We do. And we have some bad political theology being bantied about. Yeah. So, Dr. N.T. Wright, thank you for being with us today on the Stone Chapel Podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks again to Tom Wright for the conversation. It's always great to talk with him. The Stone Chapel Podcast is brought to you courtesy of the Lanier Theological Library and Learning Center in Houston, Texas. Thanks to Kathy Capes for editing the podcast and creating the transcript, which is available in the show notes. Thanks to Phil Keggy for our music. We're grateful for all the help getting up to speed to be a part of the Church Leaders Podcast Network. Until next time, I'm David Capes. Thanks for listening. You know, if you listen to the podcast, you know that I love research, I used to lead a research company. So I love when research helps to illustrate a question we have. And one of the questions a lot of people are having is how do we look to the decline of the family, maybe the relationship around fatherhood and issues of faith and church? Well, again, the Communio Nationwide Study on Faith and Relationships actually points to the collapse of marriage, what where resident fatherhood fits into that, and how they all point ultimately to a relationship to Christianity and the decline in the church. So visit communio.org slash study to download Communio's nationwide study on faith and relationships.